So here we are in the slide room gallery, our 10th anniversary. It all started with us three, John, Zane, and myself. 10 years ago, we started Visa, the Vancouver Island School of Art, and then... It was your idea, and you talked us into it. Yes. Is that how it We is? just agreed. Okay. I was, I was <laughs> is convinced. That, is yeah. that, we said, so, okay, well, sure. Did it seem like a good idea at the time? It did foolishly think like a good I idea, and it has turned out to be a really good idea as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So one of the things about running the school and teaching and always talking about art is we rarely get to talk about our own work and think about our own work and sometimes people are even surprised that we do our own work because we're so engaged in other people's work. Yeah, so, that was a question I used to get a lot from yeah, students. Like how do you have time to do work or what kind of work you do? So this is a great way to show everything that we do and also uh, how you can make art no matter how much you have going on in your life mm -hmm. and what I was observing about the show is really it's just three people who don't necessarily have the same way of thinking although obviously we do have some things in common but it's interesting how the show really works together and everybody tonight was talking about how that the work all has a kind of intimacy that's forcing you to look closer at the work. Like you can't just walk by. You, you can't find the answers right away. You have to kind of stop and look at it. So I thought that's interesting because we're all teachers and that's what we do as well. Yeah, we try we're all and, art educators. We try and make people stop and look at work. So, yes. yeah. so Zane, do you want to talk a little bit about your work? Uh, sure, I can talk about um, the privilege of making artwork, and I, I appreciate what Wendy, what you said about how do we find time to make artwork. Well, uh, I've often said you're never more alive than when you're making art, and I, I really believe it because I just spent the last month working on these pieces, and I feel totally alive. It's fantastic. So, anyway, uh, should we go over to a piece and look at it? I'll just quickly talk about it. Um, uh, I got to do everything I'm interested in. I'm interested in medieval art. I'm interested in religious triptychs. I'm interested in the Bauhaus School of Design. I'm interested in Malevich. And I'm interested in the phases of the moon. So there you go, all four of them put together. So uh, yeah, I started, uh, and I really love building things, putting them all together, and I really like mathematically figuring everything out. And I didn't want to base this on the golden section, I wanted to base it on just the expansion of the square. So uh, that down to there is a perfect square with a square in the bottom, and then I lined the squares up on the other side like that. So that and that is part of the composition, those two spaces, and even that is the two and a quarter inches across there. So it, the math is a really, really important part of the piece to me. And uh, It's interesting how you chose to install them quite low. Yeah, well, we tried putting them a little bit higher, and it just didn't feel white. Obviously, it's a bottom-weighted composition because everything's falling like that. And, well, here, I'll just lift it up for you. That is so wrong, is it not? Yeah, they feel much more like a sculpture yeah. somehow when they're lower. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, we can talk about my work. So this is a piece that I just made, but it's actually of two years' work that I cut up and reassembled. So I temporarily can't remember exactly what the title is, but it has to do with cells that they're always uh, reinventing themselves, but at the same time always dying, and it, those two things kind of work together. So I like to build my pieces, and this was uh, a way of getting away from the rectangle. So, and it's a continuing piece. It's going to grow much bigger. So, and then I have some pieces that are rectangles, the Audubon pieces over here. Formalized in the rectangles. Yeah. 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 
So I would say part of my whole art, art practice is my struggle with the rectangle going in and out of it. But these are uh, paintings based on using the Audubon prints from a book. So I felt like this makes sense to use a rectangle because it's his rectangle and then there's rectangles within rectangles. And it's the first time I, I've actually felt comfortable about framing work because usually I feel the frame confines the work, but I guess the idea of the repeated rectangles really seem to work. And this is also about um, cells and how when you start looking at things in really minute detail, you can break things apart and look at it as a scientist looks at the work. So, and now we have John's work. Oh, sure, maybe we could come over here. Um, So I guess about um, about three years ago, I got interested in the idea of shifting from, I've been working on with paintings and developing them with sculptural uh, elements. And I, I, for different reasons, I ended up working very small. And at some point decided to shift the idea of the support for the painting like from a canvas to a book. Um, and I guess I, one of the things that I think when you do teach, you get very caught up with language and definitions. Uh, and so for me, words become really important, like the word support, which is the word we use for anything you paint on, a panel or a canvas, uh, took on a lot more resonance than just the, that literal meaning and took on a, a, a sense of, the sense of what, I guess, what it is that could offer resistance to painting, to painting itself, which is an act and as a material, it's kind of all consuming. So what can sort of offer a sort of resistance to this act of being consumed? Um, and a lot of what happened with these books was this process of the book being, being somewhat consumed by a series of processes. I mean, they're not all painting processes, but in some ways they're all kind of activities that for me belong to the, a kind of painting brain. Maybe there's another way of talking or thinking about it than referring back to painting, but this is my sort of mythology coming up. And so I'm, I'm a little bit stuck with it to one extent or another. Um, but so a lot of these books, what would happen is they develop as the inside actually becomes just evacuated and the outside gets built up and built up and built up. And inside each one, there's usually some sort of small fetish um, that gets lodged in the work. And it's kind of a weird process. I get totally impatient and it's actually very much like reading because you're kind of consuming and you have this odd memory state where you're not really hanging on to what you've consumed or what you've just consumed. Everything you've just remembered seems to be there to propel the next thing that you're going to read, but you really haven't prepared yourself for it. Uh, and in that way, it, there are analogies to reading and painting that kind of fascinate me. Or, I mean, I, I imagine others would get other things out of them, but for me, there's something about hybridizing those two experiences.